The views expressed on the Final Straw Radio do not necessarily reflect those of Asheville FM, Friends of Community Radio, or any of the affiliate radio stations airing the show. From the studios of WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is the Final Straw, and I'm Bruce Goodness. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. Also, if you're interested in rebroadcasting any episode or segment, you're free to do so. Just send us an email so we can brag about it. You can find radio-friendly versions of the show as of 59 minutes in length by visiting archive.org and searching for the collection called The Final Straw. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw, care of Asheville FM, 864 Haywood Road, Asheville, North Carolina, 28806. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. This week we spoke with members of The Base, which is an anarchist space in New York City, about the newly formed revolutionary abolitionist movement NYC Community Bail Fund. In this episode, we talk about the concept of bail and its origins, what folks have happened to them from the moment of arrest to the moment bail is set, what it means to have an explicitly abolitionist bail fund, the intricacies of the corporate bail bond system, and many, many other topics. We end with a surprise follow-up question to our previous interview about Burn Down the American Plantation, a text which our guests authored and put out earlier in 2017, so stay tuned for that. To hear that previous interview, you can go to our blog and search the phrase Burn Down the American Plantation. To support this initiative and for more information, you can go to fundedjustice.com and search Abolitionist Community Bail Fund for New York City. You can also connect to the Revolutionary Abolitionist Movement via all the social media platforms for updates and ways to get involved. If you're in the Asheville area, stay tuned for the next two weeks during Words to Live By at 1 p.m. on 103.3 WSFMLP, Asheville FM, right before the final straw, where we'll air radio shows from the Channel Zero network of anarchist podcasts and radios of which we are a proud member. Tell your friends. Also in Asheville, at 7 p.m. at the county jail on New Year's Eve, there will be a noise demonstration against the current jail, against the proposed new women's facility, and for a world without incarceration. If you bring noisemakers and signs, it's hoped that participants can get the attention of folks on the outside to the failure of the carceral state to bring justice, only to immiserate the marginalized individuals and their communities while lining the pockets of state and capital, as well as to get the attention of those on the inside and let them know that we're thinking about them. Also, if you haven't yet, we'd like to invite you to check out our ongoing new podcast series entitled Error 451. An HTML 451 error delineates a page being unavailable unavailable due to political censorship, a reference to Ray Bradbury's novel, Fahrenheit 451. Well, our occasionally weekly podcast features me chatting with different folks about tech security issues from an anarchist perspective. This week, rather than our usual guest, William Buddington from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, we'll be joined by Pat Boyle from Unicorn Riot to talk about cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, the increased usage of them to enrich the far right, and how we can fight back. You can find this appearing on Wednesday alongside past episodes of Era 451 and this here radio show, The Final Straw, at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. It was announced today that members of Hudson Valley Earth First is in the second day of a tree set to stop the Valley Lateral Pipeline in Wauwanda, New York. From their press release... On December 8, 2017, Millennium Pipeline Company started clearing trees for the Valley Lateral Pipeline, which would connect fracked natural gas from the existing Millennium Pipeline to the scandal-ridden Toxic Competitive Power Ventures CPV power plant. Courts and government will never protect the land, but these brave beings have put their lives on the line to save endangered species and sacred wilderness. Day 2. We have a direct update from one of our tree sitters. Quote, cut trees leading toward wetland and eagle's nest and to wetlands and farm fields and forests where I hear cutting. Pretty quiet where I am. Swaying in the breeze a bit this morning, trying to keep snow from getting in warm bags, and that's working well. 
This fight is only beginning, and this is the first known actual tree sit in the Hudson Valley ever. We need more affinity groups willing to take action against these projects and their world. CPV, Millennium, Legoland, and that which destroys the bioregion. Minisink Lenape Indigenous Land, end quote. For more updates and photos, Hudson Valley Earth First face- Facebook page, you can just go to facebook.com and search Hudson Valley Earth First. If this 7.8-mile pipeline is completed, it would run through ecosystems which contain and have the potential to contain endangered species such as the bald eagle, a mating pair is known to live 30 feet from the right-of-way, the Indiana bat, and the bog turtle. Additionally, if the CPV plant is fueled, the pollution from the plant releases tons of chemicals known to increase cancer and asthma rates in nearby areas. This pipeline is the bottleneck to stopping this plant. Aides to government Cuomo and CPV executives go to trial in January over a bribery scandal. Also, if the pipeline is stopped before August 2018, the CPV plant will likely go bankrupt and this beautiful bioregion will be spared from further ecological destruction. After nearly six years of fighting this project, we are running out of options. Tree sits are a form of aerial blockade where individuals rig themselves in trees or sit on a small platform hoisted into trees to prevent the cutting of that tree. Additionally, the rigging of the tree sitter's platform can be attached to other trees to protect an entire area of forest. This tactic relies upon the unwillingness of a logger or company to take human life in the pursuit of economic enterprise, like the building of an unnecessary and polluting pipeline. Tree sits can be long-term endeavors, and Hudson Valley Earth First is prepared to stay in the trees as long as it takes to protect the wild. For more information on this, you can go to the facebook.com Hudson Valley Earth First page. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. What you say, what you say? Recently, in a civil action filed against the ODRC by a prisoner who was assaulted by staff here at WCI, the Ohio Attorney General's office disclosed a number of documents. Included in that discovery was the safety data sheet for the pepper spray used by ODRC staff. Since this prisoner was assaulted with pepper spray, he's entitled to the safety data sheet on this chemical spray. In case you're unfamiliar, safety data sheets are the documents put out by the manufacturer of a product, giving you the A to Z about the product's proper use and any potential hazards the product might pose. The safety data sheet related to the pepper spray used by Ohio prison guards is 10 pages long, so I'm just going to hit the highlights. I've already mailed out a copy of this thing to friends, so through a little luck and the magic of the interweb, That safety data sheet will be scanned and posted in its entirety at seanswain.org. So here we go. The chemical that Ohio prison guards use as pepper spray is called oleoresin capsicum, or OC spray. According to the safety data sheets put out by the manufacturer, you are advised to obtain special instructions before using OC spray and not handle it until all safety precautions are read and understood. Anyone using OC spray should use personal protective equipment. The manufacturer recommends chemical splash goggles, suitable protective clothing, and respiratory protection. Users should wear eye face protection and use only outdoors. This is the stuff that guards here routinely spray directly in prisoners' eyes, while neither guards nor prisoners wear any of that protective equipment. There's a prisoner in the block with me right now, Brandon Hoffman, who was sprayed in the face months ago for not hanging up a phone fast enough, and he still has visible burns on his eyelids. Anyway, back to the safety data sheet on this chemical nightmare. The safety data sheets advise that if exposed to OC spray, you should get medical attention. If sprayed in the eyes, you should rinse your eyes cautiously with water for several minutes. If skin is exposed to OC spray, you should wash with soap and water for at least 15 minutes. If the spray is inhaled, you should remove the victim. Yes, the safety data sheet refers to the subject sprayed by their product as a victim. You should remove the victim to fresh air and keep it rest in a position comfortable for breathing. 
the manufacturer advises that artificial respiration may be necessary. Artificial respiration. You may have to do mouth-to-mouth -to, -mouth to keep the victim alive after using this stuff. Of course, Ohio prison guards do none of this. After prisoners get sprayed directly in the eyes, they get cuffed and marched to medical where a nurse fills out paperwork, and no water is ever applied to the face or eyes of the prisoner. The prisoner is then marched to a holding cage and seg that is the size of a phone booth, deprived of water for maybe hours. So the instructions from the manufacturer are never followed. But let's look at what we can expect the consequences to be in the happy rainbow and bunny rabbit world where these safety protocols are followed. According to the manufacturer's hazard statements, OC spray causes skin irritation, serious eye irritation, drowsiness or dizziness, cancer, and maybe genetic defects. I repeat, cancer and genetic defects. The manufacturer warns the user, the state of Ohio, that this stuff causes cancer and perhaps genetic defects. It is a Category 3 for toxicity to a specific organ after one exposure, a Category 2 for corrosion irritation and serious eye damage. It is a Category 2 for genetic defects, and it is, get this, a Category 1A for causing cancer. And that's when you follow the instructions. Imagine what it is when you sit for hours with this chemical death, eating your face off. On page 6 of the data sheet, it appears the manufacturer provides the thresholds from its own testing of the amounts of this OC spray that were required to kill a rat. Oral, dermal, and inhalation. In parentheses next to each amount is the word rat. Another chemical was apparently used on rats and rabbits. According to this data sheet, if I were a lab rat, I'd be dead by now. This stuff is so incredibly evil it has to be placed in special containers for disposal. Under a subheading of ecotoxicity, that the manufacturer includes the phrase, toxic to aquatic life with long-lasting effects. That means the great noble souls attempting to rehabilitate me and inspire in me a newfound respect for human life can spray me in the eyes with this cancer cocktail and leave me burning for hours in a cage the size of a phone booth. But whatever they do, they don't want to expose their goldfish. Mr. Bubbles would not like this. The fact is, the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corporation is deliberately waging a deadly murderous campaign of chemical warfare against the defenseless captives in its mismanaged care, spraying known cancer-causing agents on a regular basis, one that possibly causes birth defects, with absolutely no regard for the long-term social, ecological, or health effects. These are chemical experiments that would make Adolf Eichmann jealous. These monsters call me a criminal? Who knows? This stuff may be the same chemical that takes spray of protesters. Anyone who seeks more information from the manufacturer can contact them directly. Washington Laboratories, 1922, 26th Street, Northeast, Canton, Ohio, 44705. Their phone number is 330-452-4928. Fax number 330-452-3318 and their emergency telephone is 1-800-535-5053. And again, this contact information is for folks who want to learn more, not for folks who want to burn this lab to the ground. I would never propose that anyone should burn this lab to the ground. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from Warren Corruption in Lebanon, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain at Sean Swain, 243-205, Warren C.I., P.O. Box 120, 5787 State Route 63, Lebanon, Ohio, 45036. Updates on his situation and more writings by Sean can be found at seanswain.org. Welcome onto the show again. You've been on the show before, uh, but for anyone who missed the, our first interview, would you introduce yourself in whatever way makes sense and talk a little bit about what y'all do? Okay, yeah, we're from, uh, from Ram, New York City. Uh, that's the Revolutionary Abolitionist Movement, the New York City chapter. 
And we're a revolutionary project that's dedicated to um, helping freeing people from captivity and building up revolutionary anti-capitalist, anti-state revolutionary organization in the U.S. Yeah, we recently wrote a book called Burn Down the American Plantation that outlines pretty much what we're working on. So um, people can go and check that out. We got them for, uh, what is it, 12 bucks or something online. Yeah, but it's also on a PDF, so you can go check it out. Right now we're in the process of establishing a larger revolutionary organization in the U.S., and we've been opening chapters all over the country. And we hope within the next year to have pretty much, hopefully, as many as possible enough to try to change what's going on in this wretched country right now. Well, the starting point for our work, we believe that the Civil War, it never ended, that um, that the process of slavery never ended, that was transformed into the prison industrial complex, and we situate our struggle within that framework. We also try to tie our political action to people who are facing the most um, egregious uh, effects of, this, of state violence, like people facing ICE raids, the prison industrial complex, the Muslim community, the LGBTQ community. So we try to focus our work on helping people in that aspect in completely inter, um, interfacing with these communities so that we can, one, become stronger, two, it's an ethical thing to do, and three, we think we could build a stronger revolutionary force to um, overthrow the state and capital from this process. And uh, one last thing, too, we, uh, we view the Re- revolution in Rojava as kind of like a starting point for revolutionary movements in the 21st century. So we use some of that as a paradigm for what we're trying to do here. So, yeah, I think that's a good intro. Yeah, definitely. How many RAM chapters are there now? Um, let me see. There's uh, officially, let me see, uh, probably about like maybe five, four or five, but there's a lot that we have some big surprises in the future. So, you know, there's going to be a lot more real soon. Hell yeah. Are there specific okay. elements of uh, the Rojava re- revolution that you wanted to mention that were influential to you before we um, jump into the topics for the interview? Oh, yeah, definitely. There's um, a few. Yeah, there's several points that are really important. One is like, um, just like the Zapatistas, the Revolution Rojava is rooted in the Kurdish liberation struggle. But like the Zapatista movement, which was focused on indigenous struggle, they both argue that it's a movement that isn't for these communities alone, but is part of a large revolutionary process that should include everybody. So while they're rooted in a specific ethnic oppression, it's more universal, which we think is kind of synonymous with the um, anti-black violence in the U.S. That We focus a lot on the anti-blackness in the U.S., but we think that it's something that should be offered to everybody who's oppressed and everybody who has a good conscience. Secondly, also like the Zapatistas, uh, the Rojava Revolution puts um, feminism at the core of what it's doing and says that if it's not a women's revolution, then it's not an authentic revolution, which we also think is definitely the case that if women aren't put at the forefront of what we're doing, then it's not going to be a sincere revolutionary project. And that goes with gender struggle and gender abolition in general, that we think that like um, abolishing gender roles has to go in tandem with the revolutionary process. Um, One thing that we haven't written, I don't know if it was laid out completely in the text, but we also... The idea of the YPG and YPJ, that if you look at the whole Arab Spring, that the um, Revolution Rojava is the only revolution that sustained itself through the Arab Spring, while all the other ones were based off of an insurrectionary model of revolution where people rose up and overthrew these oppressive regimes. But then they were all taken over by these reactionary forces from Egypt to Libya to Tunisia. And Rojava was the only one that managed to to push an anti-state line and hold it and continue into the future. We think that's really important for what we're doing in that, like, we want to try to build up the infrastructure and the organization capable of going through upheavals and pushing a political line that can stand instead. Definitely. Thanks for going into that. Um, Did any of the other two people have anything to add before we get started? Oh, that was pretty thorough. So, uh, (laughs) (laughs) pretty happy with that um cool excellent so we're here to talk about um this uh autonomous bail fund that you are setting up and uh in order to just set the stage for it initially for anybody who is unclear or hasn't ever like brushed up against the concept of bail will you talk about what is bail precisely and how it was originally intended to function Yeah, definitely. Um, The origins of bail are actually kind of strange. They come from uh, 13th century medieval England, 
So what would happen is because there weren't like courts um, in every single town, there would be traveling magistrates that would come and uh, try cases. Um, but because it would take so long for them to travel from town to town, it would take so long for a case to be heard. They had, they had developed different ways to kind of ensure that people would come to their trial or kind of like hold them accountable for that trial if they were freed. Uh, at first, it was actually they had a relative or a friend that would stand in for them. Um, that was the original bail, was that someone else would do your uh, face your consequences if you didn't come to your trial. But then that was obviously had some problems. So uh, they ended up using land, uh, holding land instead, and the land would be taken if you didn't um, come to your trial. Yeah, and and you know those laws were passed from from England to the U.S. You know when the court system was being set up here, and it's interesting because a lot of the laws that are on the books written about bail are actually written to protect people's rights and sort of written with the idea that bail is a good thing because it will keep people from having to be in jail while awaiting trial. But, you know, when you look at sort of the growth of incarceration over the last, you know, let's say 40 years, you start seeing this escalation of like, you know, over policing and like more and more people being locked up. And then, and then that means that more and more people are faced with these two possibilities of either being detained pre-trial or paying bail and the bail system kind of grew alongside the growth of mass incarceration to just basically criminalize poor people. And so as you see like, you know, millions of people going through the system, um, you see the bail kind of like taking on a life of its own. So like the laws on the books don't, really have much to do with how um, out of control the bail system has gotten. Yeah, it really seems that way. Like when you were talking about original intended, you know, intended uses of bail, it seems like in in so far as, you know, the incarceration incarceration system can seem not really all that threatening, it seems to have been intended to be that way. But it's obviously grown into something way worse What you talked about land and people, will you talk about like what original bails were maybe set at or was money even involved? Yeah, that's something that we don't uh, necessarily have the answer to. But definitely in the U.S. it was it was about money straight away. And of course, the difference is that like with land being used as bail, uh, it was coming from a society where people were bound to their land much more, like travel was very infrequent. Um, but in the U.S., in the early U.S., like travel became much easier, or I guess not by our standards, but at that time. Um, so people became what was called like a flight risk, like they might just disappear and not face their consequences. So the U.S. started using cash bail as a way to kind of ensure that they would come to, to trial to be able to get that money back. And just for like perspective, today cash bail is only used in two countries in the whole world, and that's the U.S. and the Philippines. That's really interesting. I had no idea about that. Would you talk a, a little bit about kind of the step-by-step process of what folks typically have happen to them from the moment of arrest to the moment of a bail being set? So uh, if someone's arrested they are not going to be able to see a judge straight away. So they're they're held until they can see a judge and the judge could set the trial date. This could be um, as long as a weekend if they're picked up on a Friday night, um, or it could be, you know, 12 or 24 hours if they're picked up during the week. So when they see the judge and the trial date is set, the judge can decide to release them on their own recognizance. So that means that they don't have to pay anything to be able to walk out of um, court that day. But if the judge sees that they have previous charges or judges them to be a flight risk, then they have the discretion to set a monetary amount of bail. And if somebody isn't there to pay that bail straight away, they're just going to go right back into holdings um, and potentially be shipped to Rikers Island. Um, Another thing that complicates things is that you know when when you're first brought to court for your arraignment um the judge and the da and your lawyer whether it's a public defender or private lawyer or whoever mostly a public defender of course but um they all see your file and because they're law enforcement they have access to absolutely everything on your record and that's not just 
convictions, it's arrests, charges, things that have been, you know, like if you've been, if you are harassed by the police on a regular basis, you may have been arrested several times. And it's even possible that not a single one of those ended in, you know, being charged with anything, but everything is on there. And that's like the first page that the judge looks at and the DA looks at. And there's just like an, you know, a bias that comes with looking at a record like that, regardless of your innocence or guilt. So when you're first there, these things are being looked at and there's like an instant judgment of the person. And with all that in mind is like how bail is set. Yeah, definitely. That's a super good point. I definitely hear stories of like huge, you know, thick files being a like negative indicator of how the process is going to go. Um, and I, I'm really glad that you brought up that point. So most of our listeners will be very familiar with the inherent racist and anti-black nature of the prison system um, in no small part due to the educational efforts of yourself and many other people. Um, but I'm wondering if you wouldn't talk about, since we live in a capitalist nation, we live in a capitalist world, the pro- for-profit nature of our current commercial bond system. Um, will you talk a little bit about um, these commercial bond companies' function and how much this industry is worth dollar-wise? So when bail is set, kind of a typical range for a misdemeanor can be from zero to $5,000. For a felony, can be from 1000 um, to 25000 but um, honestly, they can be as high as a million dollars if the judge decides. So, of course, because people don't um, have that kind of cash sitting around, then they turn to a bail bondsman. Um, And this is the kind of for-profit industry that functions around this bail system. Uh, And what it allows is that for 10% of the fee, the bail bondsman will put up the cost of your bail. um, And then the bail bondsman becomes responsible for you returning to court and that's why we, we see in all these kind of uh, reality shows of, uh, <laughs> you know, bail hunters and whatnot, that they want to track the person down. So it does happen that not only having the state after you, if you don't show up for court, now you have like this kind of private company that can, can hunt you down and try to get you for, for that money that they're, they're owed from the court system. Um, another thing, too, that's really interesting is that the bail bondsmen, the, you know, these commercial bail companies are generally kind of like run like small businesses, but they're all backed by these very, very large insurance companies. And a lot of these companies providing the insurance, like sort of the, the, that are underwriting each, you know, bond payment or bail payment. They're like a total of like, you know, 10 or 15 companies that are doing all the underwriting. And there's about $2 $2 billion of profit made each year by commercial bail companies, but it's almost, or more than double that um, being made by these giant insurance companies. And, you know, these companies are like, uh, you know, Goldman Sachs and AIG and these these really huge companies. And not to mention, they make profit that is then not taxed because they're able to, you know, use like offshore tax shelters and use these loopholes that the government provides them. And um, so it's like an extremely hidden process and there's a lot of layers to it, but it's, it's certainly like, you know, basically just like robbing poor people, regardless of their innocence for the profit of these giant corporations. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure there is, I'm blanking on the word. So like when you give somebody a loan and then there's like, you have to pay more than the loan is worth. What is that word? Interest. It's interest. I'm sure that there's a lot of interest on these loans, too. They're definitely not that, you know, not just a loan, huh? Exactly. Yeah. And it's so interesting to hear you talk about that. I also, like, I'm less educated on this topic than I realized because every time I've ever gone to into a bail bondsman, it's always seemed like kind of a... It's kind of like a check cashing place where it just doesn't seem like a huge conglomeration of, uh, you know, it's not like a Walmart or anything like that. But it was interesting to hear you talk about how many of these companies are behind it. And is there a list of those companies somewhere? It's really difficult to pinpoint because Mm. they do a great job of like hiding the fact that that's what they're investing their money in. 
Yeah. And like, that's what they're backing. And, and another thing too, is that the reason that they're able to make so much profit is because it's actually relatively rare for someone to not pay back their, the bail. Like if they don't show up for court, you know, they have the state after them and, you know, they're also like, you know, the possibility of some psychotic, like whatever it's called, you know, bail bail, bondsman. Yeah. you know, like trying to find you, like, it's actually relatively rare that someone doesn't pay back their money. And so that's why these larger corporations are doing a really great business for themselves because there's low risk. Yeah. Why do you think they want to hide that aspect of their nature, their relationship to the prison system? I think it's actually just for them to be able to keep as much money as possible. I don't even know if it's a political (laughs) reason. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's just a guess I don't know <laughs> I was hoping the answer would be that like you know that you know ma- making it seem like they invest in the prison system would mean that they were some some sort of pariah or people wouldn't want to do business with them but that's obviously not mm. not yeah. the case at all well I I've read that that for a lot of people who have what's considered a diversified um portfolio um as like investors who play the stock market um investing in things like private prisons and other uh you know justice system related things is just like a smart move that's sort of like a a given yeah Yeah. for sure so would you talk about the ram nyc community bail fund um i'd also love to hear your thoughts um, on having an explicitly abolitionist run bail fund since there are a few community bail funds already in action? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I guess uh, the first one that's important to mention is that we're uh, doing it for explicitly revolutionary reasons. So um, we want it to be really clear that it's not a stopgap measure or a reformist measure, but that we're directly trying to reach out to and work with people who are most um, preyed upon um, by capitalism in the state and work side by side to them with them. One thing that's important about that is that we want our work to be based more on personal connection rather than a bureaucratic process, um, because we find a lot of times that the people we work with through various projects, they've been really disillusioned by kind of these bureaucratic state processes um, or kind of institutions letting them down. So for us, that's something that um, is so important for us to counter in our work is to kind of have a give and take in what we're doing. Um, So we talk to people, we want to find out what are the problems that they're facing, how do they get into the situation in the first place. Um, There's so many reasons why people end up returning back into the jail system, things like mental illness or um, a previous record. And there's different ways that we're hoping that we can sort of together build different kinds of resources and revolutionary infrastructure so that it won't just be about a stopgap measure, like getting people out of Rikers for the short term, but that actually we can like work with people to figure out more long-term solutions like outside the state and nonprofits. Um, And of course, like a big um, uh, initiative for us is to bring people into anarchist forms of organizing because on the one hand, they're, the ones that are the most humanistic in the sense that they're driven by like what people need. But then also like we're always working against the increased bureaucratization. So we think that's like very, very important. And of course, like because of the way that we organize kind of based on voluntary association, we're very like fluid in how we work. So um, that way we feel like we can pivot based on the needs of the people that we meet through this process. So if people are facing like certain problems, like we could be figure out ways to address that. And of course, like the people that we encounter have already been radicalized um, because of the state's terrorism. So it really isn't much of a stretch to talk about our political solutions with them. And so it's kind of like a a natural kind of uh, coalition, I guess. And we'd like to kind of expand what we're doing. um, And we can talk about that a little bit more um, in a minute. I'd like to add something, too. That's okay. um, revolutionaries in the U.S. are really, really typically are used to doing spectacular actions where we focus on demonstrations or banner drops or uh, riots or anything like that, which they're all good. That's nothing like not a critique of them in, in themselves. But it's usually nonprofits that 
do things like this. And we think that it makes sense for evolutionaries to take a multi-pronged strategy to uh, relate with the public. So people don't just see us out at demos. They see us at demos when they know we're also like helping get their relatives out of prison. We're also sending literature into prisons to radicalize people. So like we're hitting the prison industrial complex and the streets and everything with a really multi-pronged approach. So revolutionaries aren't like pigeonholed into one box. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to make. Like people's lives are very complex and are made even more complex by, you know, state oppression. And I think it's awesome that y'all are doing this. Um, When did it start and how does the uh, specific RAM NYC community bail fund operate? The idea for this started a long time ago, probably like over a year ago. Being like an anarchist project, we don't really have any money ever. <laughs> so it was uh, the idea was really good, but we didn't have the uh, we didn't have any capacity to actually start it. So we started fundraising over a year ago, and we're originally inspired by the story of Khalif Browder. And for uh, people who aren't too familiar with Khalif Browder, he was um, a young guy in New York City who he got arrested, and they accused him of like I think stealing a purse or something like that, a backpack. And um, he was really adamant that he didn't do it, but he ended up staying in Rikers for, I think it was about three years. And um, the police tormented him. Uh, other inmates tormented him. He was getting in fights a lot. He got really severe. He got thrown in solitary. And he had a lot of emotional and physical damage. And then he, it turned out he beat the case, which is really rare. Because like he said, he didn't do it. But he actually like successfully managed to get out, which doesn't happen that often. But the stress and trauma of it led to him eventually committing suicide pretty shortly after he got out. So um, this became like a big national thing. Every Jay-Z and all these people are talking about it. But just like everyone else, I mean, we're really moved by it. So we're like, you know, we really need to um, intervene in the prison industrial complex or the Rikers prison jail system, I should say, in some earnest way. So we figured we could start a bail fund. But then as everything, it's complicated. So it was hard to set up. But um, after a lot of organizing, this is where we've come to. So. Uh I also remember reading that and being really affected by it, or reading the story of that young man. He was really young when he went inside, right? He was like 15? Yeah, like 16, 16 or 17. Days. Yeah, because yeah. 16 is where you can first go into the system in New York. Ugh. Yeah. Um, how do you find people? Do, you, do people come to you, or do you approach um, folks who are maybe could benefit from this kind of support? Yeah, well, we have, like, um, we have these, like, postcards that we send out, and we, um, that's one way. We pass them out all at events. We table a bunch of places. We have some web presence set up, and we've talked to a lot of lawyers, too, who can who help us out with stuff like this. But, like, um, oh. yeah. And we also have postcards uh, that we try to distribute, like, in Sidewrikers, so people can fill out the postcard with their name and inmate number, what their bail amount is and uh, pop it in the mail. We'll get it. And then we can research them online on, on web crimps and find them, find them in the system. And we'd like to also point out that we're like a small fund. We're not like a lot of other bail funds have like a huge budgets, but like we're in all volunteer, all radical. We're just revolutionaries doing this. So we don't have like some immense amount of money. So we try to get out as many people as possible, which is like right now we're trying to get out one person a month. We have a fundraiser drive going on right now for people to donate to try to help us liberate more people. So. Where can people find the fundraising page? Okay, great. So we're actually, we have a funded justice um, campaign. The title of it is Abolitionist Community Bail Fund for New York City. Um, and we have it on the Ram NYC Facebook page and, and Twitter as well. Yeah, it's also on the base Facebook and Twitter and the larger Ram social media too. So it's all over the place if you're looking (laughs) excellent excellent um you kind of already mentioned this but i was wondering about how you see bail funds specifically as a tactic fitting within a larger revolutionary abolitionist um strategy Mm. yeah absolutely um well one of the um our intentions when we started uh the ram project um, was eloquently put by Khaled. He said, we should chain ourselves to people facing the most heinous oppression from the state and white supremacists and, and not let go. So we should figure out who's having like the worst time of it and just figure out how we can um, help them 
and then not let go until we till we figure out how to really solve that problem. And it might not happen, you know, in the first month and the second month and the in the first year even. But like um, the more we we commit to that and we find other people who are willing to commit to that, the more we'll be able to uh, figure out solutions, long term solutions for the kinds of oppressions that are going on. Another reason that we chose this tactic is that it's something that's easy to do, but it has an immense impact on someone's immediate well-being. So it's easy for us to um, put our money where our mouths are, saying, well, we're for prison abolition, we're for, we're for um, the abolition of the justice system and the abolition of the state, but what's the, the fastest thing that we could do with the resources that we have that could really let people know where we stand? And this is one really good way to do it. The other reason is because, again, like, you know, we're all, you know, just individuals, like volunteers, like anarchists. It's uh, self-sustaining because once people go back to fight their case, the money cycles back into the fund. And that way we can keep bailing people out uh, after the first cycle of people. Um, not that we're saying everybody <laughs> has to go back to court. We would never, <laughs> we would never insist that anybody do that if they choose not to. <laughs> And, uh, and mostly because it allows us to get more meaningfully involved in people's lives. Um, as they face the wrath of state infrastructure, um, it kind of helps us to build um, different kinds of social relations. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it is like important to mention maybe that people do ostensibly, like if they, res- they go back to court, which you mentioned before that they do overwhelmingly, they do get their bail back. Is that right? Yeah. Cool. Yes. Yeah. If somebody makes all their court dates, they will be refunded their bail. If they are eventually found guilty or take a guilty plea, use 3%. But that's certainly worth being home during, you know, while awaiting trial. And a huge, a huge part of sort of like the connection between a bail fund and sort of like building stronger community is that um, when people are out, while they're awaiting trial, they're, of course, able to stay with their family. They're able to get better mental health treatment if they weren't, you know, already getting it. That's something that we would love to try and help connect people to, you know. And, and you know, even for the outcome of the trial, it's crazy. But, you know, if you are in pretrial detention, if you're in jail waiting for your case to finish you're 92% likely to be found guilty or plead guilty. And if you're out before your trial, you're only 50% likely of, of uh, 50%. Um, there's a 50% conviction rate. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, so that's a huge jump. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. So it seems like very, very beneficial for people to have access to these funds. Um, yeah, are you, are y'all aware of any other, um, this is just occurring to me right now, but are you aware of any other specifically like anarchist or abolitionist bail funds that you want, you know, either now or in history? There is a, um, a small group in New York city called fight to live that I learned about recently and they support queer trans and gender nonconforming people who are facing the system and they do bail fundraising as a part of their work. And I was just sort of made aware of them recently and very impressed. So that's definitely one. (laughs) And we were definitely aware of like um, bail funds for anarchists and activists, like the anti-repression committee and um, the Bay area and California. And so that was, uh, I think an inspiration for what we did thinking, okay, well we can provide this really great support for ourselves and our communities. But if we just, utilize that for other people that aren't already tapped into like an anarchist milieu, then that could be very powerful. Yeah, definitely. I'm curious if you are willing to speculate about any state response to community bail funds, or if that would be not a useful thing since the state is so good at adapting its tactics to challenges that are mounted against it. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's one thing that is built into the way that we operate where we're very fluid in what we do. So we're aware that what we do um, kind of above ground can be legislated away at some point. (laughs) So we're very happy to be very fluid with what we do and pivot and change based on um, what makes, makes the most sense and what will make the most impact. You know, if the state does kind of take on more repressive measures against this particular tactic, 
The other thing is that growing our movement is um, essential because it's better for the state not to be able to identify somebody that they think of as like a politicized person uh, versus someone from, you know, what they would call like the community and uh, kind of moving these things together and making them indiscernible is so essential for the state not being able to legislate um, against us because they do a very good job of saying, oh, well, those are the troublemakers, those are the anarchists. Let's separate them out from mainstream society and figure out a way to kind of repress them. Like we could see that in like the J20 trial or, you know, activists facing repression and uh, the grand jury calls for the grand jury after Charlottesville. So for us to grow the movement and become indiscernible from the communities that we're working with is is a very good, very good camouflage for, for what we're doing. Yeah. And also, like, for instance, in New Jersey recently, I think earlier this year, they ended cash bail. And that's something that, like you could imagine could happen if uh, things like this get really successful. But like, we don't really view that as necessarily like a problem for our revolutionary work, because like, the state will co-opt and destroy things that like we're doing like that. But it's like the main purpose is to um, relate with people who are embattled and facing repression, and facing the uh, horrific crimes of the state. So regardless of what they're doing, we're going to be there to try to make it better for people and to combat them and build a revolutionary culture. So this is just one of uh, many steps, a uh, many stage process. So that's how we're viewing it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And my like motivation and, in- asking that question was not in any way to be like to to be a naysayer or anything like that but just to you know uh yeah. think about like what to be prepared for you know not even maybe not even that close down the road but yeah. um yeah i think the fluidity of strategy that the first person mentioned before is i think like kind of a a key to success in like dealing with state things Yeah, one of the things that is definitely on the rise right now is either in places where cash bail has been eliminated or just just in general, there's like a a movement to, you know, incarcerate people less. But then we see like a huge rise in what's called community supervision, which is a nice euphemism. And what it comes down to is an opportunity for people to make money off of surveillance technology and people to make money off of assessment technology and you see all these big companies that are able to say I will figure out a way to figure out someone's um, risk level uh, on whether or not they should be incarcerated or whether they should have an ankle bracelet or have some kind of notification on their phone that tells them that they've stepped too far out of their neighborhood or whatever it may be so you know these are things that are already in use there are certain places in the U.S. that have already changed laws to enable that kind of like um, supervision and surveillance. And there are people jumping right in to make money off of it and privatize it. And the state is like ready to just say, sure, like do this for us, you know, make this easy on us. And it's just a, it's just another way for the community to be controlled. Yes, definitely. Since I, I do have a, a procedural question, which is about the, the, the concept of cash bail. If cash bail is eliminated, is there a system that is usually put in its place by the state? Well, if, repeat that. I'm sorry. I'm wondering, like, if not cash bail, then what, what does the state do as far as bail goes? Like, is there another thing that, that the state does? Well, from what I understand about the New Jersey situation is that most people get released if it's not something very uh, that the state deems very serious. So like uh, a lot of people in the local prisons in Jersey, like they're way less packed than they used to be. So people do get out more frequently. But for instance, if it's like a political uh, offense, someone will just be stuck there, even if it's minor, possibly if they deem it like, uh, you know, offensive enough. So um, that, that's why I think is the main there are other like in new york city there are a number of ways that they're trying to keep people out of like pre-trial detention and um those include alternative to incarceration programs um and what that usually looks like is the the court system referring people to community like mandated community programming and um you know sort of the 
the drive of those different organizations and the quality is pretty varied. And so, you know, people might be, um, it is about super, um, supervision and surveillance, um, you know, in many cases, like there's a lot of checking in and sort of that, that process. And of course, then you still have to go to your trial or whether you plead guilty or whatever. Um, you know, the process of like being under the thumb of the state is, is the same length usually. Gotcha. Thanks for speaking to that. Is there anything else that you want to say specifically about the bail fund? Um, I'd love to talk about a little bit how people could get involved, if that's possible. Absolutely, or... yeah. Please do. Okay, great, great. Because um, on the one hand, like uh, we'd love for people to join us and participate with us if they're based in New York City. Um, and they could uh, reach out to us on the RAM New York City uh, social media or at the email Revolutionary Abolitionist Movement at ProtonMail.com. We'd also to um, help people in other cities start up their own uh, bail funds if they're interested in that. So definitely reach out if you're in another city. I think this would be um, interesting for you to do. And we're also trying to um, put together other resources people can use because we want to stick with people throughout the whole process, not just bail them out. And then that's the end of our relationship. So uh, we'd love to put together um, a coalition of radical lawyers uh, who want to be attached to the bail fund and then help people with their cases once they get out. Because we do find that um, a lot of public defenders will encourage people to take a guilty plea, even if um, they're not guilty, which can you know, obviously result in jail time for something that is completely unnecessary. And then, of course, because we're doing this fundraising campaign right now, people do want to support the fund and contribute directly to the bail to pitch in for that. Yeah, I guess we could also add that... Um... We're, we've been moving slowly and deliberately as a organizational practice, and um, in the coming future, we're going to have – there are a lot more collectives springing up, and um, we really encourage people to uh, get in touch with us and you know, continue fighting as this country is descending into a fascist hellhole, and they're trying to take the world with them. <laughs> that we're, yeah, we're trying to present yeah. a more palatable and more um, humane political alternative, so definitely hit us up. That's excellent. Thank you so much for talking about that. I did have a f- uh, one follow-up question about the Burn Down the American Plantation book that we interviewed about some months ago. And again, uh, you stated it at the beginning of the interview, but in the book there you know, is an outline for an abolitionist and revolutionary praxis, which is rooted in both the history of and present trajectory of black liberation, among many other things. Um, how has your experience been in implementing any of the structures outlined in the text? Um, and obviously the bail fund is intimately a part of that, but are, is there anything else that you would care to add as far as this question goes? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, well, like we were saying before, we're kind of at the early stages of, of, uh, of implementing what we outlined in the text as people who've read it. And as you're aware, it's like kind of a, it's a pretty large project, so we're like moving really methodically and slowly so that we can make sure we get it right and that we won't have a lot of pitfalls other revolutionary organizations have in the country. Where, Because uh, unfortunately, a lot of times things don't collapse due to like uh, repression, but it's usually due to like infighting and people not learning how to work well together. So we're making sure we move really, really methodically. But with uh, text, we outlined um, the rooted anti-blackness inherent in the political system, which is why we focus on things like the bail fund, where we're sending, we have a project called Ram Support Through the Walls, where we're sending revolutionary literature into the prisons. So we're trying to make most of our projects relate to the prison industrial complex and a lot of these institutions that make uh, anti-blackness in society really rampant and really pronounced. Also on the flip side, though, we're all, we deal with like ice raids too, and we figure that while the state expands it's like a uh, repressive networks it just doesn't stay with one community it expands to a lot of different embattled communities so like as we see trump with his building up the wall and what he's done with his muslim ban a lot of people are facing the for, for the brunt of state repression so we've been working closely with about ice and for people who don't know ice it's uh immigration pigs that have like with carte blanche have been targeting communities lately and uh, you know they've been giving people hell and we think people need to start giving them some hell so, like, we've been working closely with people who are really embattled in this way. But um, once again, it's a slow process, and we're just getting our feet in the ground. So, but um, 
we have like a bunch of like if agent Knox fires we've been passing out to um people who have to deal with ice and we're making like you know inroads into communities that need to uh, that need to know people are with them particularly in this time so you know as the state becomes more and more fascist we're gonna get more prepared to make sure that you know that people can stand strong and have a dignified life how okay. has how has um uh the reception of the book been oh it's been pretty good we think yeah people really liked it it's uh it's a lot more people have read than we actually even expected. Like you kind of hear it, <laughs> you know, cause you put something like that out and you don't think anyone's actually going to read it. And it's like kind of really nerve wracking, but yeah, I think it's been really well accepted. So yeah, we're pretty excited about that. Yeah. We had people reach out to us that want, wanted to, and have started translating it into various languages. So this is extremely exciting for us. That's um, so cool. Yeah. yeah. And someone even presented about it at a um, conference in, in Mexico, which is pretty dope. Yeah. And some people in Australia want to start a chapter that relates with uh, indigenous struggle. Since the anti-black struggle isn't the biggest thing there, they think about like uh, making it correspond to the situation in Australia, which would be awesome, too. That's super in- incredible. Yeah. yeah. We might build a red and black international. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I was I was part of a, a book club, and if you don't have any, if you don't have um, energy for the question that I'm about to ask, um, mm-hmm. that's totally okay. But I was part of a book club that was reading uh, "Burn Down the American Plantation," and it was, you know, very very positively uh, received by the book club. But awesome. one one question that the the people had was about the Rams' relationship to like the history of indigenous resistance. Um, yeah. because, um, the, the club located that there wasn't much mention of indigenous struggle in the history of indigenous struggle. Um, uh, and obviously like if anybody is familiar with the text, it is a very short, very, very short book and no text can be like all inclusive and it, they shouldn't have to be. Um, but I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about that or had had you know, any conversations in your group about that particular topic. No, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, it's something we've talked about a lot, actually, because what happened to indigenous people in this country uh, was simultaneous with the kinds of like barbarous practices that were inflicted upon the, the black population. So they kind of run, they do run parallel. Um, it's a similar mentality that lends itself to um to both but actually it's something that we were hoping like after the book came out because like you mentioned like it, it's it's very short kind of like very succinct that we would love to uh write position papers um on different aspects of the struggle because um there's a lot of things that we weren't able um to immediately cover so we're hoping that we'll uh someday meet somebody that's inspired by this um political position and we want to contribute to it in that way yeah and there's actually um there are a lot of other issues like uh political and social issues that we left out there's not like a really deep rooted critique of like capitalism or imperialism or anything like that in the text which i think most of us like we agree with a lot of like state critiques that people have made before but we left it out because like you said it's like uh it's kind of a pamphlet it's not the longest book so you know you don't want to add a critique of everything because then it kind of becomes watered down in some ways too right so, definitely. yeah but yeah we agree the indigenous struggle needs to be paramount everywhere word mm-hmm. would anybody like to add anything else as far as this topic goes uh well i guess the lesson i put is kind of like a a plug for uh please donate to our fund um it'll really help us to um all the money goes strictly to bail none of us take a single penny for anything we do it's all strictly going into helping people get out and uh helping us as like militants um expand our political work further into the into the city into the prison so yeah every penny counts so please help out as much as possible and you know and then we'll burn down the american plantation together yes excellent <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, thank you so much for your tireless and badass work on this and other platforms. And also thank you for answering that off-the-cuff question about relationship of uh, RAM or or Burn Down the American Plantation specifically to uh, Indigenous struggle. I thank you for going there with me. Um, (laughs) As it was not a planned question, it it sort of happened organically. Um, And... uh, 
yes, thank you for your energy, for coming onto the show at such a late hour. And um, is there anything else you want to add as far as this interview goes? Well, just thank you so much for having us again. It's always such a pleasure. And um, yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Anytime. Yeah, y'all are great. Um, I also really get a lot out of talking to you and um, look forward to being able to collaborate with you in the future, too. Oh, I hope so. That'd be amazing. To connect with our guests, you can email them at revolutionaryabolitionistmovement at protonmail.com or search that name on any of the social media platforms commonly in use. Keep an eye out on our blog for further reading about the current bail system. From the studios of WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, and I'm Bruce Goodness. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. Also, if you're interested in rebroadcasting any episode or segment, you're free to do so. Just send us an email so we can brag about it. You can find radio-friendly versions of the show at of 59 minutes in length by visiting archive.org and searching for the collection called The Final Straw. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw, care of Asheville FM, 864 Haywood Road, Asheville, North Carolina, 28806. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop.